So welcome back, back to The Pulse. I'm Joan Zerkovich, Head of Operations at AAIS, and I also serve as the treasurer of the OpenIDL Linux Foundation project. As North Dakota Commissioner John Gottfried discussed in the previous segment, open source and interoperable technologies like OpenIDL are gaining momentum. Um, still, open source solutions, while viable in other industries, have not taken hold in the insurance industry, at least until now. Uh, as an industry, we've been hesitant, maybe even reluctant to collaborate across um, our entire ecosystem on broader solutions to very persistent problems. And today we'll discuss some of the data and technology challenges facing the insurance industry and how an open source approach might address them. So I'm thrilled to welcome to The Pulse today, Daniel Barbosa. Daniela is General Manager of Blockchain and Identity at the Linux Foundation and Executive Director of Hyperledger Foundation. And also with us today is Hart Montgomery, who serves as the Chief Technology Officer at the Hyperledger Foundation. Um, so welcome, Daniela and Hart. Thank you, thanks for having Great us. to be here, Joan. Very, very exciting to get here. I've known Joan for many years, so I'm looking forward to this discussion. So before we get started, uh, let me remind everyone in our audience to use the comment section below the screen to submit any questions for our guests. Um, but we'll get started now. And um, so Daniela and Hart, can you briefly describe the Linux Foundation and Hyperledger and the roles each of you play? Sure, absolutely. Let me go ahead and get started. So um, I'm the general manager across the Linux Foundation for all blockchain and identity projects. And I also have the honor of serving as the executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation. Um, for those of you who don't know the Linux Foundation for the last 20 years, it really has served as the home for many of the world's most important open source projects. Uh, obviously the Linux kernel, which uh, hopefully many of you are familiar with, was the reason that the foundation was created to, over 20 years ago. Um, and it's really, you know, today across, there's over 600 different open source projects across many types of technologies and industries. Um, that are really about creating um, vendor neutral uh, collaboration development processes where um, individuals, developers, companies, governments can come together and work collaboratively to develop open source code um, that you know, engages developers, um, that creates high quality and very trustworthy code. We, we call it you know, enterprise grade code as well. Um, so we really work together with the private sector, with the public sector, with developers, with academics around the world to build these developer um, and commercial ecosystems around the code projects that we host at the Linux Foundation. Um, in specifically to talk about the blockchain uh, space, um, uh, the Hyperledger Foundation, uh, since 2015, um, has been the place for distributed ledger technologies. And I'll let Hart talk a bit uh, more about what uh, Hyperledger Foundation does. Um, and we today, we have 12 different blockchain and blockchain-related projects um, that are currently meeting the enterprise needs uh, across blockchain use cases, which has matured even since 2015 when the foundation was for formed. As I mentioned before, uh, I've known Joan for many years. Um, AIS has been an association associate member of both the Linux Foundation and the Hyperledger Foundation since 2018, and really supporting our community in various ways, including doing events like this and coming to our events and talking about some of the challenges and opportunities within the insurance uh, uh, industry. So we're very grateful to have AIS as a member of both the Linux Foundation and Hyperledger. Um, in 2020, we also announced a new project category across the Linux Foundation, which is called the Linux Foundation Open Governance Networks. And this is the, um, the project category in which we launched OpenIDL um, in 2021. Um, and really, you know, the goal of the Open Governance Networks, which OpenIDL falls under, is really to meet a known problem uh, of running these networks um, and using what we see as the best practices around creating open source code doing open development and then applying it into running a blockchain network um, that is permissioned and governed by its members. And we'll hit upon that today. Um, Hart? Thanks. Yes. So I like to think of the Hyperledger Foundation as the Linux Foundation's umbrella project for blockchain systems, distributed ledgers, and multi-party systems in general. And what this means is we have a lot of different people and companies who are interested in collaborating on open development projects in this space. And so Hyperledger is a home for all of these projects. 
So right now we have different distributed ledgers that we host in Hyperledger, such as Fabric, uh, which you know OpenIDL is based upon. Um, we have identity-based systems and stacks like Ares, Indy, Ursa, and Anoncreds. And we have other things like tools for you know, blockchain interoperability uh, and integration. And the Hyperledger Foundation serves as an umbrella for sort of all of these projects to work in a collaborative environment and benefit from shared knowledge. Great. Well, uh, clearly the insurance industry can benefit uh, from better collaboration and a, a lot of these topics as you just mentioned, um, particularly in the areas related to data and emerging technologies. And from your perspective, and you've been working with the insurance industry now for a few years, um, what keeps our industry from working better together? Yeah, so uh, I'll still say that I'm not an insurance expert, um, but certainly, you know, working with OpenIDL over the last few years, there's a few things I've observed. You know, one of the things very early on in one of the first meetings that we had as an OpenIDL open meeting, um, and I observed this um, and kind of, you know, I, I think about this moment all the time when I think and I talk to um, carriers and regulators that are participating or wanting to participate in OpenIDL, um, is that, you know, in that first few me meetings, where people actually said, you know, they looked around the room, they saw that they were having these conversations around what OpenIDL was building um, and with their competitors in the room. Um, and it was very, you know, um, enlightening to us because we see this all the time in open source projects. You always have competitors working together and collaborating on open source uh, code projects and standards and other types of things. Um, so one of the first observations I observed was having you know, the carriers basically in the room looking at each other and say, wow, I can't believe we're, we're collaborating uh, together on these things. Um, and I think this is really important uh, from the in insurance industry. It is no different than some uh, very competitive, other competitive uh, industries, whether it's financial services, um, and really being able to say, you know, there is this great fear of collaborating with competitors, but there doesn't have to be. There is a neutral place, and in, in the case of, of OpenIDL, a neutral place for people to come together with has proper antitrust policies and practices into place that people feel comfortable and can drive together the code contributions, the governance models, et cetera, that need to be put into place. Um, so I, don't, I think that the insurance industry just can continue working better together um, and um, you know, learning from you know, under other industries, and we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. <clears throat> um, absolutely, I agree with everything Daniela said. Uh, Collaborating in open source, it, you know, it can be difficult for companies that haven't done it before and don't have the experience. Uh, but there are a lot of areas where it can be synergistic for everyone in a field, even competitors, to work together, to collaborate, to build something. Um, and then the question becomes ownership, right? Who owns this? Where is it hosted? And that's where the Linux Foundation comes in. And that's the true value add and utility of the Linux Foundation. Um, well, certainly our industry has tried to come together on occasion um, to solve some of our major issues. Um, and there's been quite a bit of investment in time and money. Many of these projects were able to demonstrate some sec successful technology platforms, but they really haven't continued on. Um, so why have these joint efforts failed in the insurance industry or elsewhere for that matter? Maybe you've observed them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll start off. So, you know, I, I do think it's it's helpful to look at other industry projects from both a technology and a governance perspective. Um, so, you know, we breaking up the the how these networks, these blockchain networks have been put together um, from an industry perspective, whether it's the insurance industry, whether it is in trade finance or in supply chain. Um, it really, I think, is important to break up the technology because the technology is proven, it scales, it's enterprise grade, it has a strong ecosystem of vendors supporting the technology already um, that have many, many years of like running these networks and being able to administer these networks. And I'll, I'll let Hart kind of talk about the technology side of it. Um, but when you think about the governance of how the governance of these networks are set up, and I think, you know, based on observations and discussions that we've had, is that many of these past projects failed because there, there was no, um, 
uh, no way for the participants to understand and to you know be part of the governance models. So it you know these networks that are dependent uh, perhaps on a single ver ver vendor or a charity where there's not the governance models that you see in something like Open IDL. So it needs to be open. It needs to be accessible. Um, we like to use the term inclusive, right? It needs to be an inclusive network that. Um, organizations uh, in the private and public sector can participate in so that you have in the insurance industry, for example, that you have the small and the big carriers really at the table, around the table together, um, and they understand how to participate, how to you know, join the networks and how to drive their business use cases within those networks as well. I totally agree with that. And I'll take a little bit more technical take on it. So fundamentally, a blockchain is just a distributed database with decentralized trust, right? It's, it's a database with these fancy decentralization properties. And lots of times when we see blockchain or distributed ledger projects fail, it's because they have centralized governance. Mm -hmm. And you can immediately ask yourself the question, what's the point of having a decentralized database with centralized governance? It, it just doesn't make any sense, right? So time and time again, across, you know, really every industry, we see that one of the most common reasons that distributed ledger or blockchain projects fail is that they have centralized governance, or there's really one entity in control. And you have to ask yourself in that question, in that instance, why did you use a blockchain? Why didn't you just have this central entity run everything? And the blockchain you know, coalitions and uh, deployments that we do see succeed often have proper decentralization and proper decentralized governance. So this is, you know, really just agreeing with and amplifying Daniela's point. Um, but I, you know, it's important to tie back into the the technical reasons of why the blockchain as well. Yeah, um, you know, really uh, great. Uh, ideas here to share with the group as a whole in terms of that uh, decentralization inclus and including everyone. Um, and we've been using the internet for so long and some of these open technologies for so long that many of us uh, may not know or remember what it was like before we had the internet and the World Wide Web and, and what made that technology so successful. It's the same idea that's making blockchain networks successful and that you know, back before the internet, there was this idea that if you wanted to use electronic mail, we would all log into the same um, IBM mainframe, but it to exchange electronic mail. Well, that's interesting, but it's only limited to a small number of companies that could afford to attach uh, to that type of email system. Um, so it, was, it wasn't inclusive very narrowly focused. Um, there were other networks for exchanging files. And, and again, you had to be on a proprietary, centrally controlled um, network that allowed these files to be transferred. But when the internet came along and the World Wide Web, it was a completely different paradigm. Now we're talking about a very decentralized use of networking technology to store data everywhere and to provide access to it. And the smallest to the largest uh, company or individual could access the platforms and get access to information. And I think that's the same thing that we're seeing here with the use of distributed ledger technology, blockchain technology, is that we have to get back to thinking about things a little bit differently. So get away from that very centralized proprietary perspective of the world and begin to go back to our roots, so to speak, of uh, you know, that open platform, open source, decentralized, accessible platform. Um, and so with that, within the Linux Foundation, you have been working with in many different industries and many different projects. So where have there been successful collaborations that um, improve the eco ecosystems with, say, an open source consortium approach? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we, I, I can talk about a few of them. So I'll start with the fun one. Um, I always like to talk about this one because um, um, it, it is uh, it is an interesting, when people think of open source and the Linux Foundation, they don't necessarily think about these type of industry uh, use cases and consortiums that are built to really solve business needs. So the Academy Software Foundation um, is one that is focused on the film, the animation and visual effects industry. Um, and if you think about it, the 
movie, you know, the the movie um, um, companies, right? They're not technology companies. They're not software companies, um, and they keep kept having to recreate code or build the core engines that make movies uh, over and over and over again. Um, and that takes away from their, uh, you know, the investments that they can make on building more competitive creative processes, right, on top of the software and creating better movies for all of us to enjoy. So the Academy Software Foundation is an example of industry coming together, a very competitive industry as well, then, and realizing that they could build collaboratively these code bases that then they can invest um, at the competitive, you know, of creative processes in, in front of it. So the Academy Software Foundation is an interesting one if you think about uh, that. Um, another example where it is not a technology industry, um, the on, uh, automotive grade in, uh, Linux. Uh, so automotive grade Linux started in 2012. Um, and it is, you know, the automotive industry is a very competitive global market, right? You have car manufacturers who are competing uh, around the world, and they're not, once again, technology companies. I think, you know, more and more car manufacturers are certainly becoming technology companies. But in 2012, when the automotive grade Linux projects was started, um, there actually um, was, you know, they had to... Um, come together and decide which things they were going to collaboratively build out, which is actually pretty uh, aligned with how OpenIDL today is working on, right? There's code there's uh, that's being created together with the participants of OpenIDL. So automotive grade Linux is another example in the automotive market you know, a competitive market that is not technology focused. And, and these industry leaders came together to create code and software together um, so that they once again can, you know, spend their time, you know, building out the, the better cars as well. And we see this across the board um, uh, at the Linux Foundation, uh, including, you know, uh, in financial services with the FinTech Open Source Foundation. Um, and that is another example. And if you take a look at some of the successes, and Joan, I know you've had um, um, Gab, Carlombro, who's the executive director, come and speak at AIS before, you know, really about the benefits of the in pushing the banks to contribute and collaborate in these open uh, projects um, has really driven a lot of uh, great development and, you know, great advances, I think, in the banking industry as well. Um, yeah, I think that those are some really great examples. Uh, so I'll go for something a little bit more theoretical here. Joan, I really liked your analogy of the Internet. And one of the reasons the internet works is sort of, you know, as, as anyone who's looked at networking knows, the hourglass shape of the protocol, right? You know, you have sort of TC IP in the middle, and then there's a bunch of stuff above and a bunch of stuff below, but we sort of can all agree on, you know, the, the middle part of the protocol, right? And, you know, no one's selling you, you know, TCP IP. And that's sort of what we're discovering is, is the role of open source software in a lot of these industries is that there's a collaborative base that people can build together and then really build the value adds on top of that, right? You know, if, if you're building a website or really anything on the internet these days, you're not reinventing TCP IP, right? You know, you, you're building on top of that and, and your value add is on top of that. Um, and that's how we're really seeing, you know, all kinds of industries, not just traditional tech industries that are using software um, are discovering that they can use open so source software to really, you know, decrease development costs and focus on things that add value. Mm -hmm. That's a great example, uh, that foundational level that we all agree to use. And, um, you know, adding to what you mentioned, Daniela, is that when I think about um, the automotive grade Linux, uh, the um, automotive industry has mm -hmm. invested in open source for quite some time. And um, there's a continuing uh, movement to look at how open source technology will be leveraged for the new mobility technologies, such as the mm -hmm. uh, Mobi group that uses uh, Hyperledger technology as well. But it's again, let's not all try to reinvent this ourselves over and over again. They're taking from what they've learned from years of experience with the Linux Foundation and they're saying, OK, what are we going to build together as this base foundation so that we can get on with the business of building these really great uh, applications, uh, new uses of mobile technology uh, and the way automobiles are going to be used in the future. So um, they're able to accelerate that work because of their years, years of experience in um, 
open technologies, but and also with the Phenos uh, project um, and talking with that group, they have had a lot of success working across the financial industry to develop these common platforms for quite some time. But then they realize that it's really important to collabor collaborate with the regulators because all of the technologies that they're developing have to be scrutinized by the regulators and, and to pass um, their, you know, looking under the covers. Um, and so that collaboration in this open source, um, open governance kind of uh, environment is really important to these industries that want to move ahead quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and I'll add to that, Joan, because you, you hit it on the, on the head, is um, from also from a regulatory governance perspective. So the regulators and you know governments worldwide participate in Linux Foundation projects, and they sit around the table with the private sector, with you know for certain projects, with even citizens um, that are you know very in, in, you know, vested in the technologies. Um, and we see more and more governments really approaching uh, and uh, the use of open source, you know, within their own systems, but in participating. And Finos is an example of that. Open IDL, right, where you have the in, uh, insurance regulators already participating in Open IDL uh, with a seat at the table. And I think that's really critical if these uh, industry consortiums are going to uh, function and be successful. Is that you have to have uh, the, the the you know the regulators basically in the room as well, participating and becoming members of that network. Um, and, and I think OpenIL is a great example of that. And that brings back inclusivity again, because the regulators are thinking about the entire uh, ecosystem in general, the smallest to the largest participant in any of these networks. And so that kind of comes forward um, in these environments as well. It's, it's great. You can do a lot of really great things uh, with uh, large organizations that can fund some really interesting technology, um, but it might not be that those uh, solutions can work across an entire industry. And so by bringing um, all of the participants together, including the regulators, you're going to begin to get these solutions that are really a, a viable outside of a very small, limited group of uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, what, what you get is also you get them to educating the markets and the constituents right, throughout the uh, their industry as well, which is quite helpful. Um, and I think we've, we definitely have found that with the insurance regulators um, in this project. We even have in Hyperledger, you know, government employees that are full time code maintainers on our projects, which I think is really cool. Wow, that's great. Yeah, and I know I do know that I could, because I'm on the mailing list that there are a number of um, state organizations that are sponsoring their staff to participate in, um, in a wide number of forums that are looking at new uh, distributed ledger technologies and how that is going to impact not only the way the states conduct business but how they regulate going forward. They need to understand that, and so by participating in these forums, it gets them ready for the changes that are coming. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've talked, you know, we've mentioned governance, um, and that is such an important role within the Linux Foundation and uh, was really important to me that when we began working together, I knew the Linux Foundation was so good at governance and had decades of experience um, in this area. So how does decentralization and governance work um, in an open source community like OpenIDL, and why is this different from any past ever, uh, efforts, for example, in the insurance industry? Sure. And, and I'm going to define a little bit about what OpenIDL is, because um, okay. to make sure everybody um, who's listening today. Um, so OpenIDL is an open insurance data link, right? And we believe it's the first industry open source network um, that provides the following, right? It's a secure permission-based distributed ledger. Right, so it's security first, permission-based, um, distributed ledger technologies being used, and it really is a data sharing platform between the insurance carriers, the regulators, and the stakeholders. Right, we were just talking about how at the Linux Foundation and in a project like the Open IDL, there's really a place for that collaboration to take to take place. Um, and the platform itself can address you know many use cases, um, the use cases that are being uh, worked on today, but even future use cases as well. And you know the goal is you know to be able to have the open IDL network from a governance perspective to be governed by the participants, once again, the carriers, the regulators.
regulators. And uh, we also have a category of infrastructure partners that are helping um, to, um, you know, to, to, to maintain the, uh, the network itself. And what um, the goal is really to see, you know, increased operational efficiency, um, high level of data security and transparency. And this is very important, obviously, in how OpenIDL is addressing um, their use cases, um, accessing insights to the data. Um, and, you know, we really think that, and we've seen this in other Linux Foundation projects, right, is that there's actually new business insights and business level, you know, new businesses that can be built on top of a network like the OpenIDL network. Um, so I hope that kind of helps a, a, a bit on the understanding um, of what OpenIDL is. And with that, so we do have a governance structure in place that, uh, again, for the Linux Foundation, it's tried and true. That's another thing that I think is really important here is that you have a, a lot of experience working with a lot of the technical issues uh, around building uh, technology and this network, but also what it takes to bring uh, all of these uh, groups together and effectively govern the project going forward, uh, not only from a business perspective, but also um, from a technical uh, perspective, which mm -hmm. I'm sure, Hart, you're in the middle of it at times with lots of folks there that have great ideas and a lot of passion for what they want to build. And you help people come together and work through those issues. And it's a governance process about what is the technology platform as it moves forward. Absolutely. And one of the things that I think we're really lucky in, in working for the Hyperledger Foundation is, you know, a lot of the rationale for a blockchain is, is very similar to the rationale for, you know, working in the Linux Foundation, right? It's all about decentralization. Um, and in Linux Foundation projects, we always try to set them up so that if one company or one individual or one contributor goes away, that, you know, there are always other people who can move the project forward and, and keep the project going, right? Um, by the same token, we don't want any one person or company or, or individual controlling the project, right? It's all about decentralization. Um, and, you know, the, the neutral decentralized governance, you know, really helps companies and gives companies assurances that, you know, they can build products on Linux Foundation open source software, or they can rely on that software. You know, if you're relying on a proprietary product, if the company decides to discontinue it, you know, well, you just might be out of luck. Mm -hmm. Whereas if there's a decentralized open source project, if one company goes away, well, you know, there are other companies maintaining it. And, you know, in the worst case, you can contribute yourself. And if you have issues, you know, it's open for you to fix them. Um, yeah. It's um, a very good point. And um, I think a, a lot of folks also don't know that, you know, more than 90 percent of the computers, the servers that are running on the Internet today uh, run the Linux software underneath. And it would be very difficult to think about a single entity owning that platform. And if it went away, what would happen to the internet? The fact that we're able to trust the internet to build new applications on top of it, feel comfortable that our, there's minimal business risk to do that is because of the open source Linux Foundation governance um, of that software that we know that it's going to be there no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you if you look if you look at how these projects are uh, you know operate, if you think about it from a technical governance perspective, is that any developer or even any business person or lawyer can go in and actually take a look through the charter, understand how the project governance is structured, understand who uh, who's participating, right? It's you know you can see who's participating, who's contributing, um, and really you know be able to um, have a way in. You know, we call it like to be able to on forward yourself into a project and make, um, inf you know, influence the project itself. Um, we have this term in open source that it, it is a duocracy, right? And those that show up and do are going to be the ones that are going to have obviously the most influence within that project. And I think it's really important versus some of the, you know, other projects, other consortiums that might have been set up where it is really those who come in with, you know, the bigger, the bigger wallets, right? Or the, the bigger check um, in to participate. So it's really important for us from a project governance. And if you go to any of the Linux Foundation uh, open source projects websites and you look through their website, you can easily find the, the charter. 
I mean, the technical charter of how these projects are, are governed. Um, you can understand who are who's participating, right? You always understand who the members are. Um, and I think that's just a very important part of what the Linux Foundation brings to the market um, around these technologies is having that clear understanding of how open governance um, and decentralized development really works. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, certainly um, it's the, the open ideal, open ideal appears to be gaining traction. Uh, we've had a number of proof of concepts, um, at, particularly around regulatory reporting. And we have one that's going on uh, right now with North Dakota around the identification of uninsured motorists. Um, and in this case, uh, Commissioner Gottfried was interested in one, proving that the technology works, but also demonstrating to our larger um, industry participants that um, we can do things differently and better uh, through the use of this new platform. And so through the pilot project, we were able to de demonstrate right away the technology works. That's really not the issue. It was brought up, the network works. Uh, we were able to then, without ever exchanging data files the way we did in the past, where we would ask a carrier to grab a bunch of data and send it to a regulator, instead of doing it that way, we were able to allow the carriers to keep that data private in their own decentralized you know, uh, database and ask a question. So for this policy, is it registered in the North Dakota Department of Motor Vehicles database? And we were able to do that without ever really exchanging the raw data, but just answering the question. And what was interesting about that is uh, very early on in the project, um, some of the uh, carriers that were participating also had an additional question is, can you give us some information about the registration for these uh, vehicles that we insure? And so we were able within a day to create a new uh, query that would allow them to answer their question again without ever moving data from one place to another. Um, so that's been very exciting um, to see that happen. And I think it changed the minds of all the participants about how the technology works. It's easy um, and what it can do for us. So, um, you know, what other benefits uh, do you think we could bring through this open source environment like OpenIDL and other open source blockchain networks? networks um, to, you know, what could we do to improve the insurance ecosystem? Hard, do you want to take this this one um, and start off and talking about security and privacy? Yeah. Um, as kind of Absolutely. I really think we're just scratching the surface in terms of what we can do uh, with respect to querying data in a private and secure way. You know, um, Zero knowledge proofs on blockchains, for those of you that are familiar with what they are, are really just starting to take off. And I expect that, you know, in the future, you know, I'll be able to submit, you know, an encrypted transaction or a, a commitment to a transaction or some data or something and just issue a zero knowledge proof to, say, a regulator that my transaction or my data follows some policy. Right. And I won't even need to show the regulator the data in the clear. Um, so, you know, I think we're really just, again, scratching the surface of, of what we can do. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, decentralization is extremely powerful. Uh, decentralized ledgers are sort of the, the base, the, you know, the core of decentralized data and sharing. And, you know, as we build more and more sort of exciting stuff, uh, you know, I'm really excited to see all of the possible applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the, um, you know, other things that we think about occasionally is also being able to link together uh, types of information that we can't link together today because of security and privacy issues. And by leaving the data securely in the, the open IDL node that, it, for example, a carrier has um, during, for example, a, a weather catastrophe, we are now increasingly seeing third parties that are able to take images um, at an individual address level um, because the emergency services needs it. But certainly the carriers would love to have access to that information because it helps with their claims activities. And um, in the case of one carrier we recently uh, talked to that ensures a number of armed services um, clients being able to show the images of what happened to that property 
um, right away to somebody who might not be local to where the weather catastrophe hit is really important to them in terms of serving um, their customers. And so uh, in the past, it would have been difficult to do this because the exchange of what is often considered personally identifiable information or confidential information, you really can't do that and you can't do it real time uh, in the way we've done things in the past, where after the fact, we've gathered a bunch of data up and sent it out to link it to other sources of data. By having this data available on the network all the time, because we're using it all the time, we're able to link data together very quickly within hours or days, uh, for example, for an, a catastrophe response or um, some other type of um, information query that we didn't see coming. But because we have the data already on the network, we're able to answer those questions. Yeah, you know, and I think, you know, for many of us, we spend so much time just thinking about the technology, Joan, right? Like, mm -hmm. what is actually how it's working and, you know, um, and what it needs to do, um, that those type of stories, like, it, they always delight me and make me smile, because, you know, that is about, you know, a, an organization, you know, creating a better customer experience for their customers. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they, they're not going to go to their to their customer and say, hey, we did this using blockchain, right? They don't care, you know, the, the consumers won't care what technology is behind it. They just want to understand and have a better, you know, experience like, like you described. So I think that, you know, it's always very important to keep an eye, you know, to keep in mind that these technologies are for the purpose of, you know, do, you know, having a better experience with the consumers at the consumer level from an insurance perspective. Um, and it's great to see those kind of stories. And I know we have a few of them uh, coming from OpenIDL, different projects that are taking uh, place. So, um, so thanks for sharing those. Yep. <laughs> um, so we're starting to get some questions here. I do want to remind everybody, uh, go ahead and post your questions at the bottom of the screen if you have them. Um, we're going to go ahead and kind of, I've got a couple more questions here and then I'll be able to address the questions that I'm seeing popping up on the screen. On the screen. So, um, so we just quickly, uh, Danielle and Hart, um, how does the Linux Foundation view the Open IDL project? Um, do you see it has, if it has any application to other industries? Can we contribute? Yeah, you know, you know, I think, you know, the, the need for having better and faster data is a need that crosses all industries. And, you know, even if you think about the insurance industry as a whole, um, it cuts across other industries. So healthcare, trade finance, supply chains. Um, so I think there's a lot of really important foundational work that OpenIDL is currently working on um, that can be applied to other projects. You know, in my mind, in, in kind of in my, in my, when I think about the future of the Linux Foundation around these open governance uh, projects is that, you know, I can see them, you know, networks of networks um, all within the Linux Foundation umbrella, where the OpenIDL network in, interacts with other networks in, in different industry use cases, um, using the same technology, using the same go open governance models and, uh, and decentralized development models that we put together for OpenIDL. So um, I, I definitely see uh, OpenIDL one of many uh, more projects that address um, you know data um, and data sharing across industries for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, I, the the lessons learned from OpenIDL will influence certainly a lot of you know blockchain projects uh, within Hyperledger, but also outside of Hyperledger. Um, you know, data sharing is a pretty ubiquitous problem, uh, so I expect you know there are a lot of people watching. Yeah, you know, and my 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 goal, Joan, um, is I would love to see you know open even open IDL contribute, and we're we're headed there, right? Contribute code contributions back into the Hyperledger Foundation for the Hyperledger Fabric project as core code that then becomes you know basically upstream to to the Hyperledger Fabric code base, um, and I think you know that is just such an important ecosystem that the Linux Foundation has an opportunity to to grow, right? And to, you know, to, to basically uh, help um, organizations like OpenIDL contribute back to the core uh, uh, fabric code bases. So we're getting there. 
And we've already benefited from it, certainly in the open, coming into the Open IDL um, project, because I can remember early on, as we were developing Open IDL, we'd say, we could really use, and somebody said, that's in the next release. Another industry had the same problem. They've already contributed code. Don't worry, you don't have to build it. It'll come in the next release. And that's really powerful um, by participating in, in uh, these projects. Um, so how do carriers and other stakeholders get involved? Yeah. So it's very simple. You know, if uh, carriers and other stakeholders are already members of the Linux Foundation, you can join the Open IDL network. Um, the way that we do our membership uh, fees are they're based on the t a number of employees, full time employees that organizations have. Um, and this really allows, once again, you know, back to what I talked about, uh, about in having an ability to have to be inclusive of all types of companies, really allows equal access um, for, for members, for new members. So if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, you can join the OpenIDL uh, project um, based on the number of employees that you have. If you are a, a carrier, for example, um, we also have uh, associate level memberships for the regulators. Um, and it's great to see the amount of regulators, uh, state regulators that are already participating. Um, and uh, if you're not a member of the Linux Foundation, you can join the Linux Foundation, which comes with a lot of different benefits around open source strategy for your organizations, uh, comes with lots of access to training and different events around that really focused on why open source and how open source is being used uh, worldwide. Um, so, you know, it's very easy to join. Um, and once again, we are an open community. So if you want to come and listen in on some of the uh, technical steering committee work, or the architecture work, um, these are opportunities for you to come in and listen, uh, participate, um, meet with others, uh, other uh, participants in OpenIDL, as well as staff. Um, and um, I know there's also a, a, an all access member option for AIS. Um, Joan, if you want to explain that one, that would be great. Um, so there's lots of ways that people can get involved um, with OpenIDL and the Linux Foundation. I'll just jump in and say everything, you know, technically is very open. We encourage people to come in, to kick the tires, to lurk. You're more than welcome to show up to meetings, you know, and not say anything and just listen or sign up to email lists. You know, we want to make it very easy for people to get started and to learn and to get involved. So please feel free to, to jump in and, and do all those things. We are as open and as transparent as possible. Um, yes, and as Daniela mentioned, uh, AEIS has our all access uh, membership model, uh, which many of our members are beginning to take advantage of. And with all access comes uh, a membership in OpenIDL and the Linux Foundation. So that's what it means to be all access is to be a participant. So we encourage everyone to look at that option as well for um, joining in these projects. Um, so we have some questions. Um, and uh, the first one I have here is um, insurance data is particularly vulnerable to bad actors or hackers. And how does OpenIDL handle data security and privacy compared to what happens today, for example, in a centralized model? Should I take that question? That's a great question. So the key here is that data is stored decentralized and kept local. In an old centralized model, right, there's sort of one honeypot where all of the data is stored. And if a hacker compromises that, then everyone's data is gone. Here, data is, I, I'll sort of abuse notation and say data is stored at the edge. And what this means is that, you know, you might be able to compromise one node and get some data, but you're not going to get the data from the whole network. Um, and this makes it much harder to get all of the data and also disincentivizes hackers since the reward for sort of capturing one node is much less than if the system were centralized. Yeah. I will say in the future, I think, you know, there are a lot of potentially uh, exciting cryptographic technologies that could be applied for even more privacy and confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of effort for very little reward, where is um, right now centralized databases, it's it's pretty easy and it's a, it's a big reward. So um, let's see, how do we uh, how do you ensure that collaboration is not breaking antitrust laws? It's a really good question. Yeah. Daniela, you want to take that one? 
Yeah, well, you know, the, at the Linux Foundation, all our project meetings, um, from our governing board meetings to our open meetings, even our meetups, any time that anyone gathers on their Linux Foundation, um, we we start the discussion with, you know, a slide, our antitrust policy, um, and trying to make sure that people understand that when they're collaborating, when they're meeting, when they are working within the Linux Foundation project that they're participating in, that you do have antitrust policies uh, that you have to adhere to. This makes it, once again, we talked a bit earlier about how you know, companies come together and, you know, they compete sometimes, you know, face to face, you know, any type of, of, of interaction that they have in the in the public or within you know, other industry events, for example, they are competing. Um, and, you know, that gives them the opportunity to basically work together to collaborate um, and to make sure that then what the outputs of those collaborations are also seen by the marketplace, right? the consumers, by their customers, by the government officials, that that, that that process has been taking place. Um, and that's really important. And under the Linux Foundation, we offer that. Um, we also offer uh, assistance with uh, for Linux Foundation members who want to learn more about working within you know, antitrust policies. There's a lot of great um, uh, readings that you can do. Um, and obviously, you know, we have have access to lawyers um, that can participate as well. All Linux Foundation members that have in-house legal counsel also get their legal counsel to be part of the Linux Foundation Legal uh, uh, Council, which is a group of lawyers. I can't even go to these meetings. They're just lawyers <laughs> um, that also talk about things that are important and importantly also how to use and understand open source licensing um, for building you know products and services that these companies have so the linux foundation has a lot of great resources from a legal perspective and making sure that the code is um, is is built collaboratively together um, and uh, following the antitrust policy we also have very very strong all are welcome um, requirements where, you know, regardless of where you're coming from, what your background is, uh, what your gender, what your region, what your, you know, even language is how do we make sure that we build truly inclusive, um, you know, projects. Um, and that's really important to, to us here at the Linux Foundation. Uh, absolutely. You know, we are obviously not lawyers, uh, but, you know, one of the best things that we do that, you know, sort of where our legal policy is in alignment with our community policy is we try to make everything as open and transparent as possible, right? You know, there are no, you know, backroom meetings or, or deals or anything like that. Everything is out in the open. Um, and we think that's great for the community. Um, I've got two more questions here before we need to wrap up, but um, I do want to make sure we uh, answer this first one. Um, because it's at the heart of OpenIDL, where it's, most insurers view proprietary data as their secret sauce. And how does the OpenIDL project uh, protect the carrier data while sharing it at the same time? So how do we control unwanted sharing? Should I take that? Sure, and, and yeah, I'll jump in as well, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so really the entire point of this blockchain architecture is fine-grained data sharing, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that you can share data with precisely who you want, uh, you can exactly account for who you've shared your data with, uh, you know, that's the core of the project, right? And so this is, you know, protecting your secret sauce of data to the maximal amount possible, really. You know, this is, this is why this system is, is architected as it is. And I, and I can add to that because, again, that question is really, at, at, as you mentioned, at the heart of why open IDL, we pursued it. Um, with the ability to store carrier data, which is the secret sauce, yes, and some of it is data that carriers need to protect. The design of open IDL allows carriers to always control that data and to be able to answer questions without moving the data out of their data center, as was recently demonstrated in the North Dakota project. In order to be able to answer the question about whether or not a vehicle that is insured by a carrier is also registered with the Department of Motor Vehicles, we were able to encrypt some data and match them together and answer yes or no. Is the vehicle on this policy 
registered, we can answer that with just a yes or a no without ever exposing the data that the carrier feels is proprietary and really important. This is my customer. It's a vehicle that I insure. I don't really want to give out a list of every vehicle I insure, but we were able to answer the question without ever moving the raw data across the network. Mm -hmm. So um, at the heart of the network is answering that question. And again, uh, participating in the open IDL community will provide access to all the folks that can answer your questions in detail about how that technology does that. Um, last question before we go. So how will we go about measuring or proving the enterprise value and business return on investment of utilizing blockchain or open IDL? So I think this is a difficult question to, to answer and I'm not sure um, it, you know, either you can jump in and, and say how you, you do this across other projects. But, um, you know, from my perspective, um, the, the, the carriers, the businesses that participate in any of the Linux Foundation projects have a, um, a strategy, a vision of where they want to go, how they want to move forward. Um, and that return on investment may be very different for one business versus another. But um, Hart, I see you nodding your head there. Do you have some examples of how people have measured that value? Well, certainly, you know, in many, in many cases, right, you are replacing a traditional system or a set of systems with a new blockchain based system, right? And in those cases, you know, it's much more straightforward to sort of see how much money you've saved, right? You know, in finance, you can, you know, if say, you know, trade finance clearing, right? You can see how much faster you clear with the blockchain settlement, right? Uh, then you can say, well, if I have this much extra money availability, what can I do with that, right? And you can then, you know, uh, compare that to the cost that you spent on a blockchain system or participating in a blockchain system. Uh, you know, and, and people have done this in finance and, and generally are, are very excited about the potential of blockchain in this case. Um, there are some cases though where it's a lot harder because blockchain and distributed ledgers enable things that sort of weren't possible before. Uh, and there it can be really tricky to analyze, you know, business value because you're not necessarily competing with a legacy system. You're enabling a totally new application. Yeah. A really good example. And I'll take us back to the World Wide Web. I remember when um, it was just emerging and it actually as an application wasn't that exciting, but it grew over time. And uh, very often uh, people would say, but why would I use the World Wide Web? And it's because it enables us to do things that we couldn't do before. It's not that it replaced our um, internal file sharing system. It enabled us to share information across the industry, across many industries that just isn't possible in any other way. So yeah. well, with that, um, we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, again, Danielle and Hart, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Uh, very insightful, um, you know, response to the questions here, uh, information about the Linux Foundation and OpenIDL. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you yeah. for having no, us. No, thank you for having us. Um, OpenIDL, I think, is a, a leader in the industry, and uh, we are very um, interested in making sure that everybody can participate and join us. So um, looking forward to seeing everyone there. Great. All right. With that, we're back to the polls. Ed, we're back to you. 